I want to create a uh, playlist um, of short videos uh, dealing with uh, individual passages in the Christian scriptures and then I want to pose it to the viewer um, the question uh, whether the passage in question was more likely spoken by Jesus of the New Testament or the Emperor Titus Flavius of history contemporaneous to um, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. So we have these figures all from the first century. We have uh, Jesus, Jesus, Joshua, Yehoshua, you know, people pronounce his name in so many different ways, but one thing is certain, and that is that there was no hard J sound uh, in either Greek or Hebrew back then. Um, I don't even know if there is now, but definitely not back then. And um, so the way his name is pronounced, uh, Jesus, uh, these days is just an impossibility. And yet Christians will tell us there is, and the Christian scriptures assert that there is no other name under heaven by which man can get saved. Anyway, we have no idea what this person looks like. We have very little, uh, if any, historical corroboration of the man's existence. Um, there are some, I can think of at least one apocryphal description of his appearance that seemed to have been written by a monk or something who must have been gay for them for the idea of the man or maybe just gay period the way he described him is like he was describing a woman um, anyway just just by a cursory read of the thing it, it was obvious that the work was uh, apocryphal and yet here on YouTube I think you see people covering it as if it's some reliable source. I mean you've got you've got people on YouTube who are so poorly studied that they they can't even discern which works are canonical or dependable or reliable or authoritative and which aren't. Um, anyway, so we don't know what this person looks like, and that results in lots of, uh, lots of racist, divisive debate with, you've got Afrocentric people who are suggesting that he was black, or asserting outright that he was black, and that the white man is trying to take... Jesus away from them, appropriate their culture. You've got white supremacists who think that Jesus was white. Um, uh, this all despite the fact that he was supposed to have been, according to the accounts, a Jew. And yet no one even really looks to find out what Jews look like in the first century. And there is a source for that. The Mishnah um, actually states in a in a oblique way, like it's not even dwelling upon the fact of Jewish skin color, but it states as it's treating um, the signs of leprosy, uh, basically skin malady, um, 
and the the colors of the symptoms of leprosy um it it uh it says that um you on at one end of the spectrum you've basically got like Teutonic people I forget the what the word it uses is but the translation I think refers to something close to the Germanic people you know and it says that they're they're really white and then at the other end you've got uh, Ethiopians suggesting that they're really black and then it says that the um, children of Israel are an intermediate shade that uh, they are the color of boxwood which is um, the color of many native Israelis um, in Israel today but it never occurs to these agents of duality who are either pushing for the white Jesus or pushing for the black Jesus that there might actually be intermediate shades in the Mediterranean and uh, and that the children of Israel might have actually been an intermediate shade um, anyway another figure from this period um, is the Emperor Nero, which the word Nero means black. And this is, I think, a suggestion of also the Afro, uh, Afrocentric activists that that uh, Nero was also black, and, and this is just another evidence that uh, all of <coughs> all of civilized history is, has been black and just uh, whitewashed by white people. But anyway, his name meant black, and he was also called the first Antichrist uh, by the church. Um, I'm not sure who it was who called him that, but it was fairly well known that he was the first Antichrist, so that you have some people pointing out that the letters of his name actually add up to 666 and they talk about how he died and and how that fulfills you know prophecy in the book of revelation etc anyway he's an important figure from the time period I'll I'll describe why in a moment then you have the emperor Vespasian and apparently his birth name is Titus Flavius Vespasianus um, and, uh, and then I put that his code name is the Father in Heaven. <coughs> and he was a Roman general who was, uh, allegedly, according to Flavius Josephus, um, I'll show you, like, a little sketch of... Flavius Josephus right here. I guess this must be him when he was shaved as a Roman POW, if he was shaved. Anyway, um, this is some sketch of him. I don't know how accurate that is. I doubt that it's very accurate. It's probably just something created for a book. And then, uh, I guess this is another sketch here but they almost seem to represent like a stereotypical Pharisee or something which uh, I think Flavius Josephus was supposed to be of the Pharisaical line I don't know and, and maybe even descended from the priests I forget exactly um, but some suggest that maybe Josephus didn't even actually exist, but that he was just a another or a character ghost written by the Romans to prevent a or present a Roman history with a Jewish flavor. Um, I don't know whether that's true or not. Um, 
I don't find that to be a central question because whether the history came from the Romans ghostwriting a Jew saying these things or whether it came from an actual Jewish POW under Roman custody, the end result is kind of the same. <coughs> It's a it's a history that you have to um, read critically. If you take it at face value, you're kind of naive, kind of stupid. And uh, but at the same time, if if uh, it's a history that you totally discount and don't pay any attention to. Uh, simply because of the fact that you think it's it's unreliable then you're missing out on a whole lot of uh, evidence from that time period and uh, you're basically remaining willfully ignorant there's a, a lot of really good information in Flavius Josephus as I hope to point out um, so back to our main figures. Um, and anyway, so Nero, the Emperor Nero, uh, allegedly sent Vespasian and his son Titus, uh, to, uh, Galilee and Judea to put down the rebellion against Rome there. Uh, where already the uh, supposedly the Jewish zealots um, had uh, de devastated an entire legion um, of the Roman army and had uh, had confiscated or captured that legion's uh, aquila which is their, like, golden eagle standard that their army would march before the legion, you know, as they were on the move. <coughs> so apparently this was a... as it would be for any military unit to have your standard captured by an enemy unit um, is, a, is considered shameful. Um, just like if the American flag was captured by a Roman army. So, so he sent Vespasian, allegedly, and, uh, and then Vespasian wanted Titus to come along. Now, Vespasian had already put down a rebellion in Britannica, I think is the name. Britannia, maybe? I don't know. Basically, England, you know, Britain. Um, so he had already been involved in a, a significant um, war there. So, <coughs> his son Titus, uh, this name, by the way, means dove, as all show. Um, and this was something that uh, Joseph Atwell pointed out, um, is that in this book, Our Italian Surnames, uh, by uh, Joseph Guerin something, I, uh, I'd have to page back to, to show you his full name unless it's at the top. No, it's not. Anyway, on page 130, it's pointed out that um, the, the Romans enjoyed conferring bird names upon their fellow men, such as Titus, Dove, Gaius, Magpie, uh, Gallus, Rooster, Gracchus, or Graculus, uh, a Daw. I don't know what kind of bird that is. Uh, Passer means sparrow, Corvus or Corvinus means raven, Aquila, Falco, and Marula mean 
Eagle, Hawk, and Blackbird, respectively, uh, all of which were used by well-known families. So we see there that Tidus means dove, <coughs> or at least it did to this um, author who seems to have known what he was talking about. Also, it does say that uh, the giving of bird names to persons is a universal practice which is probably as old as the human race. In Hebrew, Zipporah means bird and uh, Jonah means dove. So back to our guys. So not only does Titus in uh, Roman mean dove, but also Jonah in Hebrew means dove. And this is important in the Gospels. So Wikipedia says that his birth name is exactly the same as for Vespasian, uh, Titus Flavius Vespasianus. Now, I don't know if that might be why the um, I think it's the Jerusalem Talmud, or otherwise known as the Palestinian Talmud, uh, says that Vespasian was at the siege of Jerusalem. <coughs> I, I'm not sure if Vespasian actually got as far as the siege of Jerusalem um, before he went to Rome to become emperor. Um, anyway, if, if Vespasian the father was never at Jerusalem during its siege, um, it may be because of that that the Jerusalem Talmud still reports that Vespasian was at the siege of Jerusalem. It might be because they both have the same name, both father and son, because Titus definitely was, according to the history. Uh, at the siege of, of Jerusalem in either 69 or 70 CE. Anyway, I also call uh, Titus the beloved son for um, the reason um, that uh, Titus, um, Joseph Atwill asserts in um, his book, Caesar's Messiah. Uh, here's a picture of the cover. Caesar's Messiah, the Roman Conspiracy to Invent Jesus by Joseph Atwill. Um, there, there are actually video uh, videos, um, documentary type videos uh, on YouTube which you can watch for free. Um, about the Caesar's Messiah thesis and the I think it's called the Flavian Hypothesis which another person by the name of Cliff Carrington also uh, subscribed to and had posted on I think his own website about how the uh, Roman Flavian dynasty was you know the the that they were the inventors of the Christian myth. Anyway, so my studies that led to my <coughs> my accepting this thesis um, and I'll talk later about my my independent discoveries which um, support the thesis um, was that I was I was fairly fluent in the Christian scriptures and uh, and then uh, in the late 90s I read James or well first first I read a book in the mid 90s called Jesus and the Riddle of the Dead Sea Scrolls by Barbara Thuring. Now I don't know how Barbara Thuring arrived at many of the ideas she did in her book but her, her method at least opened up <coughs> 
a way of thinking to me that um, kind of prepared me to be ready for other ideas. Like she, she basically opened up the idea that, hey, maybe what you're reading in the Christian scriptures isn't meant to be taken at face value, but maybe there's something underlying that's going on there. So then when in the late 90s um, I finally bought a copy of James the Brother of Jesus after seeing a lot of talk about it online, um, James the Brother of Jesus <coughs> really does um, talk about how various terms in the Christian scriptures and how they're used and, and also in the Dead Sea Scrolls and how they're used are really important and um, and I've always kind of been of this opinion that the li that literal translations are better than um, uh, was it figurative or uh, forget the other kind of translation a parallel paraphrase that's it a paraphrase translation um, because um, even if it if uh, it's using an idiom or a euphemism or something, I, I want to know what those words are that it's using literally, right? And then my brain can translate the idiom or the euphemism into the the modern equivalent, right? <coughs> um, it's like when I was learning Spanish, their their word for outdoors. Um, or the one that I, the words that I was taught for outdoors had nothing to do with a door or being or being outside, right? So when I was looking for those words that I had already learned about the about a door and about being outside, I couldn't find them in the words that they were using for outdoors. They were they were paraphrasing <coughs> what the actual Spanish was because the actual Spanish was uh, something closer to in the free air. And I was like, oh, well, that makes a lot of sense. Why didn't you just tell me that in the first place in the free air? In the free air. Yeah, I get that. That's outdoors. That's where the air is free. <coughs> so... Um, I always prefer a literal translation, and James the Brother of Jesus, uh, his um, a book by Robert Eisenman, really shows why it's so important to stick with literal translations when you're talking about these sometimes esoteric concepts, right? That are in <coughs> in uh, really not just the Christian scriptures, but the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Apocrypha, the pseudo the pseudepigrapha. Um, it, intertestamental literature um, and the Hebrew Tanakh. So, uh, so we can just close these now. However, this read, this is a really sizable book. It's pretty lengthy, lots of footnotes, and and it's very repetitive, and it's kind of hard to get through. Um, but it's packed with so much gold. There are just veins of gold throughout that book that you can mine to better understand the real context of the writing of the Christian scriptures. So, back to our guys, <coughs> the real context is that in the first century, um, Galilee and Judea, uh, they were occupied by the Romans, um, and Jewish laws were not the same as Roman laws. Romans, um, they didn't have any problems with worshipping multiple gods, and they 
certainly weren't worshipping the God of the Hebrews. <clears throat> now, Romans, not having a problem with worshipping multiple gods, they might have adopted the Hebrew God, and I'm not saying that Jesus is, I'm just saying that he is supposedly representative of the the Jewish culture at the time. And I'm I'm here to tell you no he's not anyway. So on the one hand you had Jewish laws, Jewish values, Jewish ethics, Jewish culture, and and then on the other hand you had Gentile laws, Gentile culture, Jew Gentile values and ethics. <coughs> and for Jews, the two were not to mix, at least not in a intermarriage kind of way, um, unless the Gentile wanted to convert to Judaism. Now, <coughs> when Emperor Vespasian uh, he wasn't emperor yet, he was a general then. General Vespasian, and I guess G Titus could be called maybe a general then too, I'm not sure. When this father and son team of Roman m men of war, not, not princes of peace, but men of war, the exact opposite, um, when they move into Galilee and Judea to make war with the Jews, <clears throat> They're killing not just Jewish men, but Jewish women and children. They're, they are lobbing huge stones into these cities and squashing uh, Jewish women and children. And um, they're not really having that much of a problem with doing so. Um, all they know is that the said town appears to be rebelling against Roman authority and they're there to squash that rebellion. Doesn't matter who gets squashed. <clears throat> and then that's supposedly when uh, Josephus gets captured as a POW and then is there to witness the succeeding events that eventually result in the uh, sacking of Jerusalem or the breaching of Jerusalem's walls and uh, the destruction of the temple uh, by Titus by the way everybody knows Titus as Titus the destroyer because he's the one who destroyed the temple in Jerusalem so let's see if I've missed anything here so Caesar's Messiah is the thesis, uh, or Cliff Carrington's um, Flavian Hypothesis, which I don't know if it's word for word or, or even idea for idea the same as the Caesar's Messiah thesis, but it is a second witness, if you will, of what kinds of shenanigans the Flavians were involved in. Now, Another important thing to consider <coughs> um, is that Nero was a Julio-Claudian emperor. Now, when he ceased being emperor, uh, it resulted in a kind of tumultuous time where uh, the throne uh, moved from one person to another in quick quick succession, relatively quick succession, and the, the, empire, uh, the empire was kind of unstable. We're, um, that's what is reported. Um, and it was at this time that um, the Roman legions, led by Vespasian and Titus, they were, they were kind of anxious about what's going on with the empire right now when they when they heard news and it was then that they put forth <coughs> that uh, Vespasian should become emperor 
and supposedly um, Flavius Josephus also suggested that uh, Vespasian was the um, fulfillment of the star prophecy in the Torah that a star shall come out of Jacob which how this guy I mean it would have to be Jacob as a, geo a geographical reference not Jacob as a racial reference <clears throat> because Vespasian didn't you know it, he's not an Israelite he's not a Jew he he can't represent Jacob in that way so maybe Josephus was saying that the star coming out of Jacob Jacob being a reference to Israel and a reference to the land so he's saying that <clears throat> this is a fulfillment of Vespasian's becoming emperor um, so anyway emperor uh, Vespasian does go to Rome uh, to become emperor and then meanwhile Titus is left behind he's entrusted to carry out the rest of this war against the Jews <clears throat> so you can imagine like the considerable trust he placed in this son now this wasn't Titus's or this wasn't Vespasian's only son there was also Domitian who succeeded Okay, first em uh, first Vespasian was emperor, then Titus succeeded him, and then Domi uh, Domitian um, succeeded Titus. So, bam, 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 father and two sons um, were all emperor of the Roman Empire in succession. Um, I'm being a little redundant in my wording, but my apologies. So, Titus... <laughs> is the beloved son and um, I get the feeling that Domitian may not have been as favored as Titus was by Vespasian um, and it's I think there's a definitely I think whereas Vespasian and Titus were of one mind on things I think Domitian was an entirely, he had a very different uh, outlook on things, I think. Um, maybe as like the put out son, there was maybe some resentment there. <coughs> anyway, while these two were in Galilee in Judea, I believe that they began the writing of the Gospels. Um, <clears throat> and it should be noted that these two, as emperors of Rome, were worshipped as the Roman state god. So in, in Roman eyes, both of these men were god. So there's a little bit of your trinity right there. First the father was god, then the son was god. Also, when we see that these men's names, their birth names are exactly the same, um, it kind of brings up words like, he who has seen me has seen the Father also, you know, and, and there's a, like a whole bunch of stuff in John about that that we could dwell on, but not right now. <coughs> um... At the other end, we've got this literary figure, Jesus, Jesus. We don't know what he looks like. There's no contemporary or cont contemporaneous history about him except what we get in the Christian scriptures. <coughs> um, but these men, they're all very tangible. Now, I also wanted to point out these busts of Nero, they may be unflattering because the Flavians did not like or agree with the Julio-Claudian emperors. So once these came into power, they <coughs> had some control over the history. 
So then the history could speak badly about Nero. Now, why... Are there any re other reasons they might speak badly about Nero? Well, the Jerusalem Talmud, contrary to um, accepted history, reports that Nero converted to Judaism. And Flavius Josephus actually corroborates this in a measure by saying that before that conversion, um, that both Nero and his wife Poppea were very interested in learning about Judaism, and, the, and I think that Josephus even says that I think he says that he actually visited Nero and Papia. If it wasn't him, it may have been like an Agrippa or a Herod or something. But I'm pretty sure it was Josephus who says he visited Nero and Papia, and they were very interested in Judaism. But the Palestinian Talmud... Um, outright states that Nero converted to Judaism and that the Jewish leaders advised Nero to go into exile um, because otherwise he would be assassinated. Now the official Roman history is that Nero committed suicide. <coughs> um, well, <laughs> um, when if Nero did indeed convert then his circumcision could be seen as a metaphorical suicide because at his conversion he would cease being the Gentile Nero and he would um, take on a new Hebrew name. <coughs> My suspicion is that, and I should have put this here, but it's just a suspicion of mine, is that Nero is the resistance leader Simon that um, Titus eventually brings back to Rome to be executed there and that this is where th we get the legend of the death of the Apostle Peter or Simon Peter where he was supposedly crucified upside down in Rome, and that's how he was executed. <coughs> um, Flavius Josephus is clear that the resistance leaders Simon and John, um, their end was um, it. It was in agreement with the strange, um, very specific uh, prophecy at the end of the Gospel of John about Simon Peter <coughs> and John. That um, Simon Peter would be led about where he did not want to go and that John would tarry until he came back or something like that, right? And and what this demonstrates is that the Gospel of John, at least, is very was dependent on the works of Flavius Josephus, at least the the Wars of the Jews. I'm not sure about the Antiquities. <coughs> um, because it's not until you know you, you read the Gospel of John, and it's kind of strange how he he singles out both Peter and John. You know, the story's always like, you know, these these apostles were like more significant than the other apostles. But <clears throat> but when you read the war and the destruction of the temple and Flavius Josephus, it's very clear why Simon and John are singled out. And that's because Simon and John were the resistance leaders like, that Titus fought. <clears throat> Now it can all they can all make a nice little joke about it in um, the Christian scriptures um, by having Titus, who is also Jesus. Jesus is just a literary mask for the Emperor Titus, 
And that's why, whereas Hebrew scripture um, was either in Hebrew or Aramaic, <coughs> up until you get to what I call the Christian addendum, Christians call the New Testament or the Borit Hadashah, Messianics like to call it, but that literature is in Greek, right? They like to pu like push that, oh look, here's a Hebrew copy or blah blah blah, but that literature is in Greek very early on, like our earliest manuscripts of the Christian scriptures are in Greek, <coughs> not in Hebrew or Aramaic. So why would you think that the Jews would accept that as scripture? So, <coughs> so Titus is represented by this literary figure, Jesus. And, and it's all backdated by about 40 years because Titus wants to show that the events that he participated in were fulfilled in a prophecy right and that's the the sign of Titus's divinity that he was prophesied about and that the things that he did were the fulfillment of that prophecy <clears throat> um so yeah um let's see so we can close this we can close this now for these code names, uh, Vespasian, I, I looked up what Vespasian means, and <coughs> it says derived either from Latin Vesper meaning west or evening, or Vespa meaning wasp. <coughs> and this was the name of a first century emperor, Titus Flavius Vespasianus, the founder of the uh, Flavian dynasty. Now, here, one of the most um, important passages linking the Christian scriptures to the Flavian dynasty um, is Matthew 24. I think they call it the Little Apocalypse or the Little Book of Revelation or something like that. <coughs> and there it says, For uh, as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west. Well, this is like the exact opposite of the direction you would expect. Um, you know, the the sun does rise in the east and set in the west, but that's not how <coughs> the Flavians uh, came to the area. Uh, they came from the west uh, into the east. So anyway, here it says west very prominently right next to the word so shall also the coming of the son of man be now definitely titus was a son of a man vespasian <coughs> but in the christian scripture son of man is taken to be you know like a messianic term i think mostly based on was it the book of daniel Anyway, then this passage is really important, but I should talk about this at another time, because this is a key in describing uh, the linkage between the sayings of Jesus and the Roman Flavians. <coughs> so, we can kill this now. And I uh, tried to see if there was any connection with the Hebrew word for black, I didn't uncover anything, but that might be because I'm not, you know, fluent in Hebrew. <coughs> now, I did want to point out that um, the Caesar's Messiah thesis, um, it uh, suggests that uh, the Gospels are written in such a way that they're kind of a mirror of the military exploits of Vespasian and Titus <coughs> when they invaded Galilee and then Judea. Now, there are events that happen in the Gospels, <coughs> and one thing the Gospels do, or at least in the sayings of Jesus, what is done over and over again, is to say that he who has ears to hear, let him hear. 
He who has eyes to see, let him see. And uh, and then also there's a passage, something about like, uh, we played music for you in the marketplace, but you didn't dance. <clears throat> anyway, this seems to be, it, it seems like a, almost an in-your-face, like Illuminati speak kind of thing, where they're saying, we're, you know, they're like knocking on the heads of the readers, and they're saying, hello, McFly, hello, McFly, wake up, you know, and they're trying to say, if you'd open your eyes, if you'd open your ears, you would see that what you're reading is really about Vespasian and Titus. It's not about some itinerant, peaceful Jewish rabbi. <clears throat> um, now, there is the possibility, mind you, that uh, that Titus could have um, converted to Judaism um, or at least adopted <coughs> a Hebrew should I say Hebraized or Judaized name <coughs> as as a um, like a second persona um, the same way where Nero if he converted he would have received a new name as a convert to Judaism uh, Titus may have followed that practice but then Titus may even though he was emperor, so you would probably let the emperor have whatever he wanted, because otherwise you would, you might be executed, right? But Titus may have just converted himself, <coughs> be, because here he's created this, um, this new Christian religion, and, um, so basically he could, like, make up the rules. He could decide who gets to be in his club, and and he could also give himself a new name if he wanted to. So, uh, you know, as part of his new religion, like, he may have considered, like, his, his Christianity, this new religion, to be the true and better, or gentler, kindler Judaism, right? A new and improved Judaism. <coughs> So he may may have just given himself a new name, and that new name that he may have chosen may have been uh, Yehoshua, which um, in Hebrew is supposed to mean like um, the Creator is my salvation, or the Creator saves. And <clears throat> and then if you if you anyway, it, it's clear that he considers himself the Savior of Jerusalem even though he was killing the Jews in Jerusalem to do that. Now, <coughs> Flavius Josephus, he talks about these um, zealots or sicarium or dagger men and, <coughs> and how these zealots were the ones that, that uh, wiped out the... <coughs> the Roman Legion in at the Beit Haron Pass. And then <clears throat> that's what supposedly, you know, brought in this, uh, brought on this war, even though there's, Flavius Josephus describes all these other event, events which led up to the war, where it was clear that there were Roman governors or procurators or whatever who were, um, <clears throat> they were provoking the Jews to war. And in discussing the destruction of, the, of Jerusalem, the, the Ju um, Jewish tradition says two things, <clears throat> or gives two reasons that I can think of off the top of my head that, that get repeated often. One is that the reason for the destruction of Jerusalem was because of baseless hatred. <clears throat> now, it's usually assumed, because Jews have the tendency to um, 
feel that uh, their relationship with the Creator means that if some event happens, it's because of something they did, right? So when <coughs> when they say baseless hatred, they take it to mean that Jews were engaging in baseless hatred towards other Jews. Now that's definitely described in uh, in Flavius Josephus's covering of the war in Judea. <coughs> So, you know, there's some historical evidence for that. But the way that Flavius Josephus also writes it, I'm starting to lose my voice here, um, is that... <coughs> is that the baseless hatred may have actually been the Romans against the Jews. Because that's really what anti-semitism is it's it's a baseless hatred towards the jewish people <clears throat> because if gentiles would actually give uh, jewish people an opportunity to speak and to present their perspective and would actually give them the same benefit of the doubt that they would give any non-jewish person then Gentiles would see that they don't really have a reason to hate Jews. <clears throat> but because of the invention of Christianity um, as this anti-Jewish religion, and it really is because the Jews are presented as the enemy in the Christian scriptures, and, and then Christian tradition, you know, it has a definite sore spot that the Jews didn't accept Jesus as the Messiah. And then you have Islam. It's also anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish, because here they put forth this prophet, Muhammad, and the Jews didn't accept him as a prophet. Well, why should they? The Jews have a commandment in the Torah, which is way older than the Quran, that says that a prophet like Moses would have to come um, from Israel's brothers <clears throat> and that does not describe the Arabs so <clears throat> both of these world religions Christianity and um, Islam they've got real sore spots towards the Jews because they're the innovations they're the new message and the Jews never received their message. Well, why should they? The Jews already have their own religion, and it's complete, and it didn't need any innovation, at least not from the Jewish perspective. <coughs> so, what's left to do when the real children of Israel in the world don't accept your message? Well, then you have to paint them as demons, devils, the enemy, and you have to hate them because they're a reminder, a daily reminder, that you're a participant in a fraud. So, <clears throat> a, a racist fraud. It's a, both of those ideologies, like, you take jihadists in Islam, like, they're, they're especially like, 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 for example, the Palestinians. They, like, live breathe and sleep killing Jews. They train their toddlers um, and brainwash them to dream of killing Jews and that's how October 7th happened. This goes back to the mid-2000s when the expulsion of Jews from um, Gush Katif in the Gaza Strip happened and the Palestinian Authority had children's TV shows with Far Fur the Mouse and um, Nahul the Bee and Asud the Rabbit. And these were like basically like Disney type characters. I mean Farfour was clearly Mickey Mouse and they were people dressed up like Disney characters like you would see at Disney World or, Di or, or Disneyland and uh, 
one, uh, Far Four the Mouse was the first one, Nahul the Bee was the second one, and um, Asud the Rabbit was the, the third one, and all three of these characters were brainwashing Palestinian children to want to kill Jews. And that's, li like, there were probably like zero Muslims that had any problem with that. So, and then Christianity, it's like, oh, we love the Jewish people, but can we tell you about Jesus, right? It, it's love with a condition, and that condition is that, but eventually you're going to accept Jesus. You're going to bend the knee, and you're going you're gonna to affirm that Jesus is Lord. <coughs> it's not unconditional love, and it's not the benefit of the doubt or the common human courtesy that you would give any non-Jewish person. It's love with a condition. And that condition is contrary to everything that Jews have believed for, you know, thousands of years. So, you're asking them to do something that's totally against their culture, their values, and their ethics. And you're saying, well, if you won't do that, well, it's because <coughs> you're of the seed of Satan, you are sons of the devil, you're demons, you're the enemy. And that's Christianity, which, you know, teaches you to love your enemies, right? So the reason Christianity is so anti-Jewish is because it was invented by these two men that were exterminating Jewish men, women, and children during that whole campaign through Galilee and Judea. <coughs> and, it <coughs> and if you wanted, you could say it ended with the siege at Masada, but uh, Titus didn't participate in that as far as I know. So... So, the intention of this playlist, then, will be to show that uh, various, um, various Jesus sayings actually make more sense when spoken by the Roman general turned Emperor Titus. Especially given that the text is in Greek. So, that's what I will endeavor to do. I, I've probably m left out some details here. Um, um, well, one might be that uh, Nero <coughs> may have been called the first Antichrist because he was, if he was Simon the Resistance leader in Jerusalem during the Siege of Jerusalem, then Nero was fighting Titus. Titus, who was supposed to be Jesus the Christ. <clears throat> so that would definitely make him the first anti-Christ. So, but what does John say? That, that who is anti-Christ? Anyone who does not acknowledge that Jesus is, what, the Son of God come in the flesh or something like that? Yeah, well, Nero would not have affirmed that confession. So, I guess that would make him the first Antichrist. But, anyway, <coughs> the the Christian myth, it's a, it's a mythological uh, religion built up around the military exploits of Vespasian and Titus against the Jews in um, Galilee and Judea. If you really wanted to read the real gospel, because the note that the evangelion is that the word, um, the evangel, anyway, the the good news or the good report, um, the Flavians are saying that their military conquest in Galilee and Judea was the good news, the good report of their of their military conquest, as opposed to the evil report of the twelve spies when the Israelites uh, were entering the land of prov promise. 
<clears throat> so in the, in the mind of the Flavians, they're the fix for the evil report uh, given by the, the spies. Now, I want to point out, too, that the Roman military, <clears throat> we like some aspects of it are are almost legendary for how systematic they were, how efficient they were as an army. Like for example, they would they would um they would literally move mountains to make the road ahead of the army as it advanced so that when the Roman legions would move into an area, they were actually building a highway that would um, that could be used for uh, commerce and traffic in the future in the empire. So that it's like they were killing two birds with one stone. Not only were they making it easier for their army to to move forward, but they were also building up infrastructure for the empire. <coughs> well. Um, people tend to think that, okay, yeah, the, just the Romans moved in and they didn't have any idea of what was going on or the their enemy and, you know, they like they had no intelligence about what they were going to be doing, right? <clears throat> but there's two great victi uh, videos here on YouTube about the speculatories, the spies of the Roman army, <coughs> and also the... Um, Another video, also by the Invicta account here on YouTube, of the Exploratories, the scouts of the Roman army. And you can see where, if the Romans were using spies and scouts uh, for their Roman army, then Vespasian and Titus would have been using spies and scouts. And if they were using spies and scouts, the spies, at least, were probably passing themselves off as Jews when they passed through Jewish settlements. So there you have an example of Romans posing as Jews. And you can even, for one, that like the apostles, the sent out ones, Caesar's Messiah suggests that these were actually Roman um, scout, uh, Roman scouts, I think, or Roman, uh, basically like officers in the Roman legions, and uh, but then. Uh, but then, uh, of course, that would kind of contradict Simon and John, uh, unless, unless Simon w had been a Roman, a A.K.A. Nero, and John uh, had been a Roman, and and that's another thing that Josephus seems seems to suggest <clears throat> in a very subtle way, is that these these resistance leaders of the of the Jewish resistance they may have actually been Roman agents um, like he seems to suggest that the zealots and the dagger men and the Sicarim whereas in Judaism the spilling of blood is kind of an, ab an abhorrent thing um, it describes how these dagger men Supposedly, these Jewish zealots were going around assassinating people. <clears throat> and it seems a lot more likely that the Romans had assassins going around posing as Jews um, and assassinating people. For one, the, the Roman strategy is to divide and conquer. So the way to do that is to create like two polar opposites right so you'll have your agents um, gather people to these two polar opposite ideologies 
So on the one hand, you may have had the Herodians or the Hellenists who were bringing in, inviting Jews into paganized culture. <clears throat> then at the other end, you may have had these like hyper-zealous or super-zealous <coughs> uh, Jews, supposedly um, agents, bringing Jews over to their side towards a super-fundamentalist form of Judaism <coughs> that may have, you know, been like I ideologically overreaching. So, <coughs> I think a good candidate for that end of things may have been the Dead Sea Scrolls community because there are things in the Dead Sea Scrolls that are way stricter than anything I've ever heard about in Judaism at least today and that I'm not sure if they even really jive with the Torah, the commandments in the Torah. But, <coughs> so, then as you draw people to both of these um, poles, then you create the opposition within the people that you're trying to conquer. So because they're divided against each other, they can't focus their efforts against you. <coughs> and that's where Josephus actually contradicts the Christian scriptures characterization of the Pharisees and note that the Pharisees, the, the rabbis of today, are descended from the Pharisees. So, um, a lot of that, that hatred, really anti-pharisaical anti hatred, is really anti-Jewish hatred. <coughs> and it, and um, Flavius Josephus, he he characterizes the Pharisees as religious moderates. <coughs> religious moderates who are trying to hold the Jewish community together uh, during the Roman occupation. <coughs> and that, that brings up something I, I, um, I failed to bring up as the, as the other um, excuse in why Rome was destroyed, or why Jerusalem was destroyed. The one excuse is baseless hatred, uh, supposedly between Jews, but I think it's really the baseless hatred of the Romans against the Jews, and Flavius Josephus lays out that case <coughs> when he shows that it was the Romans who were trying to provoke the Jews to war. And if they were doing it in in the ways listed in Flavius Josephus, then they were almost certainly using spies and assassins to do the very same thing. But the other reason given is that the Jews did not deal wisely with the Romans, <coughs> or may, um, and that might be the same word as in a cunning fashion. But they didn't they didn't deal wisely with the Romans, and that. Uh, and that's the other reason that is sometimes given for the destruction of Jerusalem. Whereas the Romans, I think it is suggested in that statement that the Romans de dealt wisely or in a cunning fashion with the Jews. <clears throat> and that's kind of what's going on in America, without getting too political, is that <clears throat> it seems like the Democrats are dealing with conservatives or Republicans in a cunning fashion or wisely, but the Republicans, the conservatives, being less sophisticated than the Democrats, who, who they're not the kind of people who want to expend a lot of energy dealing in uh, deceits and designs and um, schemes there the conservatives are not dealing wisely with the Democrats and that's why the Democrats have almost seem to have everything locked down in this country they seem to have control 
and that you just so that you just have these pockets of conservative resistance in this country but when it comes time to um, the when it comes time to have bills passed the Democrats seem to be getting what they want and the Republicans are not so the same thing seems to have gone on um, in the years leading up to this invasion by the Romans is that the Romans seem to be dealing wisely with the Jews but the the Jews um, being Jews and probably wanting to study Torah engage in just simple business you know do their own thing um, did were they really equipped and even Josephus I think asserts that they weren't the Jews were not ready to tackle the Roman Empire but the Jews probably were not um, in a very earthly fashion equipped to deal with this empire that had consumed so many different cultures so this was a this was an army that had learned how so many different peoples behave and wage war so it could draw from all that experience when it waged war with the Jews. Um, although Josephus does say, I think, that there were times when the way Jews did battle, it was, it, it could still be surprising to the Roman legions. And that's, you know, that's to be expected because, like, Jewish culture is, is so alien to most of the world. So, um, anyway, I think we can stop here. So what I want to do is, despite all of the naysayers in the historical Jesus industry, all these scholars who put so much of their credibility they, they bank so much of their credibility on their theories that Jesus was a hippie, or Jesus was a communist, or Jesus was a Palestinian freedom fighter, or Jesus was a Hellenistic uh, Jewish rabbi, or, you know, it, it, this question mark Jesus over here, he becomes a, um, a paper doll where the historical Jesus industry just dresses him up to be whatever will appeal to a certain demographic. He, he's literally like a, a literary idol where you would adorn and dress up the idol to conform to your vision of whatever god you worshipped or wanted to sell to the people that came to your marketplace. Whereas these men you look at busts of Vespasian, most of them look the same. Most of the busts of Nero look the same, although I think scholars are realizing that the Flavians painted Nero in a very bad light, both through history and through art. And it was probably because Nero was seen as a traitor because he um, converted to Judaism and, and left being emperor went into exile um, and and probably into exile in Jerusalem because <clears throat> in the place in the uh, Jerusalem Talmud where it says that um, uh, Nero uh, converted to Judaism it says that Nero was in Jerusalem and he fired arrows in four directions and I'm not sure if it said that all the arrows came back or something, but Nero's conclusion from that was that the Romans wanted to make war and they wanted to blame the war on him, on Nero. So that's why, that's another reason I think that Nero was Simon the Resistance Fighter. <coughs> um, later known in church tradition as uh, Simon Peter, 
you know, who had such faith problems and doubted and <clears throat> but then later became the rock of the church for confessing that Titus was Jesus, the Messiah, you know, according to the Christian scriptures. Um, of course, Nero was, as Simon, Nero was captured and he was in Titus's uh, custody during that whole trip back to Rome. So it, it may have actually transpired that Nero may have, under duress, um, confessed that Titus was the Messiah, the son of the man who would have been the Roman state god at the time, Vespasian. Who knows? We, you know, we don't know. So, so to to wrap up here, um, I think we should. I think you should watch these two videos about the speculatories and the uh, exploratories and and understand what was really going on <coughs> when Vespasian and Titus made war in Galilee and Judea and how they were probably already beginning to write the Gospels um, the same way that Marcus Aurelius was pictured as writing his Stoic philosophy um, when he was out in the field as a Roman general himself. <coughs> um, so, anyway, I'll stop here, and then in succeeding videos, I would like to treat individual passages of the Christian scriptures and show how they are much more applicable and make a lot a lot more sense when um, when they come out of the mouth of Titus than, af than if they come out of the mouth of a itinerant Jewish rabbi, supposedly.